All right, all right, all right. We got a new video today. Today we're going to talk about the story of Reuben Carter. This video is going to be a little bit more like a superfecta of topics. We're going to cover everything from song facts. We're going to cover a wrongful convictions, a few of them. We're going to talk about true crime, and there's also going to be some sports and sports statistics thrown in here. So it really is kind of a, a mixed pot of stuff going on here. This is likely going to be a very long video. Um, it is chock full of information. I find this story extremely interesting. Um, I kind of followed Ruben's story throughout time to see what he was doing once everything kind of transpired. So I really hope you guys like this story. Um, there's a lot of parallels to the Stephen Avery and Brendan Dathy case, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but like I said, it's a long one. Grab a snack because you're going to be here for a minute. Okay, so we're going to start way back at the beginning. Reuben Carter was born in May of 1937. Um, he was born into a big family that struggled. His dad was injured and he couldn't work. And with eight kids in the house, mom had always stayed home to take care of the kids. So with dad, and with dad out of work, things got extremely rough. Um, in his preteen years, Reuben found himself in some trouble and landed his ass in a juvenile detention center. Um, at some point, he escaped from there, joined the military, and went and served our country. As soon as he got back to the United States, they were basically waiting for him and said, hey, you owe us some time. They carted him off to jail to serve what he was still due. So he was released from that, was just kind of out living life. He got arrested for purse snatching. And they sentenced him to four years in a maximum security prison for snatching a purse. Um, throughout the story, especially in the beginning, we need to remember that we're just coming off of like the, um, the Jim Crow era. So our country was extremely racially charged and there was a lot of inequality and profiling going on. Um, it was very sick and it's embarrassing that that's what our country was. And unfortunately, some of that profiling and racial inequality is still a big deal today. So Ruben's clearly pissed that he's in maximum security prison and he's working out in prison. He's doing his thing. Um, the day after he gets released in 1961, he decides he's going to be a professional boxer and starts training immediately. Now, also going on in 1961, um, Bob Dylan, was recording um, his very first song in a professional studio. So both careers are taken off roughly at the same time. So both of them are kicking off their careers pretty much at the same time. Now Bob Dylan loves the sport of boxing. Um, when he grew, as he grew up in his school, boxing was offered as an extracurricular activity. So I just want to pause for a second. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that boxing was allowed in school? Holy hell, I got a list of people I'd love to get in the ring with, and it would be okay. I wouldn't get in trouble. Oh my gosh, that would be fantastic. But anyway, back to our story. So he always loved the sport of boxing. He loved it because of its individualistic nature. Um, it wasn't a team sport. It was just all about him and his control and everything he was in control of. Um, as we kind of, most of us know, Bob Dylan came on came along to be more like the songwriter, the poetic, very literature-based guy, fact-based guy, and obviously became one of the best-known singers of our time. Basically, he's known worldwide. So with Bob Dylan's love of boxing, he clearly followed the sport. He wrote his first song about boxing in 1963, and it's called Who Killed Davy Moore? Now, Davy Moore was a professional boxer, and on a fight on May 24th, 1963, not long after the fight, he died. Um, there is, um, the Boxing Hall of Fame has the full fight on YouTube. I'll link it below if you want to watch it. Um, I watched it. Um, it's clear to me, um, I never really watched boxing, but I watch UFC a lot with my husband. Um, but it was clear to me that that fight should have ended long before it did. Um, so Bob Dylan writes the song basically calling out everybody that was there to say, hey, why didn't you stop this? So with the title being Who Killed Davey Moore, throughout that song, he wondered if the ref killed Davey Moore, if the managers killed Davey Moore, if, you know, the people who were gambling, the media, if all these people just let him continue and essentially die at the end of this fight for their own personal gain. So the song is pretty politically charged, and he throws out there exactly what he thinks. 
So back to Ruben. Like I said, he kicked off his career in 1961, and he quickly became a force to be reckoned with. I mean, he was kicking ass and taking names, and he was working his way up the ranks um, pretty damn close to be able to fight for a championship belt. Um, his last fight took place on June 8th of 1966, and mind you, this was not by his choice. So his official record stands at 28-12-0. and 0. So just eight days after Ruben's last fight, there was an incident that took place in Patterson, New Jersey. There was this little corner bar called the Lafayette Bar and Grill. There were four people hanging out in the bar. Well, three people hanging out plus the bartender. They're just in there doing their deal. Um, it's reported that two black men walk into the bar and start shooting. Now, there's a little apartment just above the bar, and a lady named Patty Valentine lives in there. She heard the commotion, looked out her window, and in the middle of the street, she saw a um, white car with triangular uh, taillights, and then she saw two black men jump in that car and take off from the scene. So she runs downstairs, sees this chaos, and then decides to call for help. Now, while all this is transpiring at the Lafayette Bar and Grill, Reuben Carter's hanging out with a bunch of ladies. You know, he's living his best life. He's doing what he's doing. He's kind of become a celebrity in, in, in you know, his area. Everybody knows who he is. So he's over there at the bar, chilling out at the club, dancing, doing whatever. And there's this kid named John Artis who is like, oh, man, my ride left me. Can you give me a ride home? Ruben's like, here, yeah, sure, cool, you can drive. Tosses him his keys. So they jump in the car along with another guy. So Artis is driving. The other guy's in the pa passenger seat. And Ruben lays down in the back seat. Uh, I'm guessing he was probably, his fun meter was pegged. You know what I'm saying? So he's laying down in the back seat. And the next thing you know, they get pulled over. Cop walks up to the car, and the first thing the cop says is, we're looking for two Negroes. So Ruben pops up and goes, oh, any two will do? Could you imagine? I mean, cops today still do some stupid, ignorant, mean crap. Just like the video I posted the other day about, about Zachary Wester. I mean, that guy is terrible. So this cop asks him that, and all of a sudden he recognizes Carter from boxing. So they're shooting the shit, whatever. The officer runs Artis's license. He's good. They're like, cool, you guys can go. They were looking for two black people, but there were three in that car. Let them go. They run by Ruben's house, pick up some money so they can go hit up some more clubs. I mean, they're in it to win it tonight. You know what I'm saying? So the third guy in the car is like, man, I just want to go home. I, I, I'm out of gas. No more partying for me. So they drop him off. And shortly after that, Artis and Carter are stopped again by the same exact cop. So this cop walks up to the car and is like, hey, guys, I need you to follow me. This is important. Artis is like, okay, you know, he's a 19-year-old kid. He's a track star. He's never been in trouble. He's just, he was trying to get a girl at the club. You know, he didn't have, he was like, okay. And Carter was like, oh, shit. Like, he knew something was, something shady was about to go down. So the cop has the, them follow him to the crime scene at the Lafayette Bar and Grill. He has them get out of the car and stand along with the other spectators and just watch the crime scene as it's unfolding. They're watching dead people being pulled out of the bar. They're seeing all of this stuff and they're like, what the hell are we doing here? They, they have no idea what's going on. So they asked um, Patty Valentine, was this, were these the guys you see? And she's like, I don't know. I didn't get a good look. You know, the trees of this or that. I was happy. So then they decide they're going to take Artis and Carter to the hospital to see the survivor, the surviving victim. Now, there were four people in the bar. Like I said, three of them did pass away. So they take Carter and Artis to see the one lone survivor. Now, this guy was actually shot in the head and lost his eye during the shooting. So they take him into his room and they ask the guy, are the, you know, they stand artist and Carter right in front of this guy who is essentially still fighting for his life and say, is this, are these the two men that shot you? And he looked up and he was like, no, that's not them. So then the cops are more pissed off. They take him to the police station and there's not much talk about how long Carter was interrogated or interviewed, but knowing what we're all going to learn about Carter here as we go on. I'm pretty sure he just zipped his lips and was defiant and was like, I'm not talking to you. Like, I have nothing to say. I have nothing to do with it, period. However, Artis, the 19-year-old kid, 
was interrogated for 17 hours. And he told his lawyer, and it's stated in the court documents, if you, they told him, if you just say it was Carter, you can go home. You won't be involved. Just say it was Carter. Just do it. And they repeated this. And every time they did, he stood his ground and was like, no, I'm not saying it was him because it wasn't him. We were together. And, you know, that he stuck to his story, which was the truth. So the next day, they're finally allowed to go home. They hear nothing more about it. Few month, four months later, all of a sudden, both of them are arrested and they're charged with the triple murder that took place in the Lafayette Bar and Grill. Now, a fun fact about what happened around four months later, right before Artis and Carter were arrested, a $10,000 reward was offered. So conveniently, these two basically career criminals, their last names are Bello and Bradley, come forward and they're like, hey, we were trying to break into this building down the road and we saw the whole thing and we know it was Carter and Artis. We saw them. Yeah, yeah, we saw them. Okay. The trial took place in April of 1967 and after seven weeks and a six hour deliberation, the all white jury sentenced both Carter and Artis to life in prison without parole. So Carter ends up in prison and he is pissed. He is defiant and he'll tell, he would tell people to the time he passed away that he, he, he was an asshole to people. Like he admits it. He was mean and angry. He wouldn't wear the clothes. He wouldn't eat the food. He wouldn't talk to people. He just, he was nothing. So when he was first in prison, he did spend a lot of time in solitary confinement. Um, and at one point he got, um, an infection in his eye and he actually lost sight in his eye because of the poor medical staff at the prison facility. Not shocking. That shit happens all the time still to this day. Again, story for another day. So he is defiant and just, ugh, he's looking for an outlet. Somehow he decides that he's going to start writing his autobiography. The only option for him to write on was the toilet paper. So he starts doing that. And then he eventually is able to get regular paper. And he's smuggling it out. He's giving it to his friends. He's, you know trying to get his story out there. He's trying to get somebody to stand up and say, hey, this guy is innocent. You know, artist is innocent. We need to get them out because this isn't right. So after working, you imagine he's in prison from 67. His book was published and released in 1974. And he encouraged his publisher, like, send it to every celebrity you can. Send it to every news outlet. Like, just send it everywhere. You know, just get it out there. So sometime, somehow, Bob Dylan and his entourage got hold of this book. So we're going to listen to a little audio now about what Bob Dylan thought when he got it and kind of where that where our story is getting ready to go. Reuben Carter was an amazing boxer, middleweight, who had been framed for a murder in New Jersey and was languishing now in Rollway State Prison. Bob wrote this incredible song, Hurricane, and was very concerned about getting him out. I've written songs about boxers before, so that was nothing new. But uh, I hadn't really thought about a Hurricane because I didn't know about Hurricane. Uh, it, it, it never really crossed my path. We got the book, I read it. Um, you know, I made a mental note if I was coming east, uh, if I was east, I would uh, visit him. We were there for uh, the, you know most of the day, as far as I can remember. Uh, we got there in the morning and then left him when it was dark. I realized that the man's philosophy and my philosophy were uh, running on the uh, same uh, road. You know, and uh, you don't meet too many people like that, you know, that, that you just know that uh, kind of on the same path mentally, you know. As you can see, Carter and Dylan hit it off immediately. So Bob Dylan wrote Hurricane and he performed it at the Rolling Thunder Review that happened in 1975 and 1976. So while Bob Dylan's out trying to raise awareness, singing these songs at every stop along his tour, back at home, Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier have just finished up the fight that's known to date as the Thrilla in Manila. They got that done. A couple weeks later, they're on the courthouse steps, rallying people along, trying to get awareness, saying, hey, this is wrong. We need to make this right. Now keep the people united, let them be defeated. The people united, let them be defeated. The people united. 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 The people
hope. There is hope for change in America. I believe in law and order, and I believe that everybody have a right to uh, give another try. Here comes the story of the hurricane. The man the authorities came to play for something that he never Here done. Is Helen Burstyn. Put in a prison cell for one time. He could have been the champion of the world. Keep in mind, and I want to point this out for a very quick second, Muhammad Ali and uh, Reuben Carter were not friends. They did not get along. They couldn't stand to be in each other's space. But that didn't matter to Muhammad Ali. What mattered is what was, do what was done is wrong, and he wanted to make it right. So I want to point that out because I do see, especially online with uh, Making a Murderer community, just... People get ugly just simply because they don't like somebody. And that, I mean, take it from Muhammad Ali, he's on my shirt, that no matter what you feel personally about someone, if somebody has done wrong, you have to make it right, regardless of personal feelings. You have to take that out of it and look at it clinically and say, hey, we're going to fix this. So eventually with all the new media attention and, you know, these big personalities coming forward and saying, hey, something's going on, the case was eventually reviewed. And wouldn't you know, the documents and audio surfaced show, um, saying, and you could hear where Bella was saying, um, oh, you know, they're telling Bella and Bradley, hey, we'll, we'll take care of you guys if you help us take care of this. You know, we'll offer you a little, you know, reduction, we'll drop some charges. And there's even mention of them being paid cash under the table. Um, I'm going to show a document now of uh, Bellow's, um, I think it's 19, dated 1975 statement where he said, yeah, they were bribing me, basically. They told me to say this, and they would give me that. Help overturn the murder convictions of Reuben Hurricane Carter and John Artis. Joel Siegel was at the concert. Dylan and his Rolling Thunder Review drizzled their way into the New Jersey State Correctional Institution at Clinton last night. Joan Baez, Ramblin' Jack Elliott, Allen Ginsberg, The Birds' Roger McGuinn, The Band's Robbie Robertson, Joni Mitchell, and special guest Roberta Flack. Set up by Dylan to ostensibly bring the music to the people and play small clubs throughout the country, the Review has instead played arenas throughout the Northeast, and traveling with the secrecy of the D-Day invasion and the security of a mafia summit, they haven't been selling out. Still in all, that is an historic event with the original cast. How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The it's been an incredible tour. It's been five weeks. Nobody killed anybody, you know. No, no babies born. It was a. It, I think it was a, a huge demonstration of trying to squelch all of our large egos. You know, and, and people came out on top and had a fantastic time. A lot of that's due to Bob Dylan, who was really sweet. Maybe to you, Joan, but not to the press, which was there in abundance. Dylan maintained his journalistic chastity without giving us so much as a hi, how are ya? Though poet Allen Ginsberg did give us some historical perspective. It's the most ancient tradition that the minstrel, the bard, go traveling from place to place and tell the news in rhymes. That's uh, before they had newspapers, before they had television, before they had viewers. It was the poet, the bard, the minstrel, the singer would go from town to town and say, who had the king arrested? Who was the enemy at the gates? Who got married to who? And who was the saint traveling? The cause was Reuben Hurricane Carter, the once middleweight contender, convicted nine years ago of murder, who's demanding a new trial. Carter is an inmate here, and we talked about music. How do you like the song Hurricane? I love it. I think it's a fantastic piece of work being done by Bob Dylan. I think the man is a genius, but even in his genius, even in his, in his wisdom, he couldn't put all these facts together within the uh, two or three minutes. It took him eight minutes to put them together. <laughs> Dylan 
Dillon played before his smallest crowd in years and his most laid back. Out of 300 prisoners, only half bothered to show up. They were well outnumbered by the press. Finally, the hurricane met the white tornado, who, as is his mysterious way, disappeared into the night. The second trial took place in December of 1976. And what you know, the fellow and Bradley changed their story back to their original statement that we saw them, yes, it was them. I know it was them. I can see their face clearly. I know them anywhere. And also in this second trial, the prosecution took up their racially charged bullshit a notch. Actually, a few notches. The prosecution was now claiming that because of an, early in an earlier incident, either earlier that day or the night before, a um, white man had killed a black man in the same neighborhood. So now the prosecution is claiming that this was a racially charged retaliation murder. So basically, these two black men were pissed off about the, the murder earlier in the day, so they went to this whites-only bar and shot up the place. That's what they were claiming. So as they're kind of putting this story out into the media and through court, all the supporters that um, Muhammad Ali and Bob Dylan worked so hard to gain for Ruben's cause started, again, turning against him. And when... The, the prosecution wasn't quite getting the, the turn that they wanted. Suddenly, the story appeared that Reuben Carter had attacked one of his supporters. Her name was Carolyn Kelly. And he put her in the hospital and he did all these horrible things to her. And, you know, he's too dangerous to be on the streets. Well, that basically sealed his fate. Um, as we can see with Stephen Avery and Ben and Dassey, they were convicted in the public eye long before their trial ever took place. That's kind of what happened here with Reuben Carter in his second trial. Um, it, it was just disgusting. And at one point in the, tr in the transcripts, it says, the prosecutor said, this is what black people do. Pardon my French, but are you fucking kidding me? And that, I, <laughs> that just pisses me off that the judge even wouldn't be like, no, no, dude, we can't, we're not going down that road. But again, in the, you know, mid-70s, we're still in this, it was, oh, I, that just makes, oh, it pisses me off so much like he would say that in court. But don't worry, that's going to come back to bite him in the ass. Spoiler alert. So sadly, just like the first jury that only took six hours to convict him, this jury took nine hours to come back and say they were both guilty, you know, give them life in prison without parole. Um. So then Carter goes back to prison, still pissed off, and this time even more pissed off. He's not talking. He's basically he basically put himself in solitary confinement. He wouldn't talk to people. He did he did nothing. He didn't open his mail. He didn't respond to letters. He wouldn't take visitors. I mean, this guy like cut himself off from the world. Well, just a few years after Carter's put back in prison for the second time, there's a young man in New York City named Leisure Martin. We're going to learn a little bit about Lesra here, but keep in mind that this boy was a teenager who was illiterate and he was working in um, New York City trying to get, you know, some money for his family and members of this Canadian commune came into his, uh, where he worked. They randomly met him and then things just transpired from there. Lesra was the second child in a family of eight. He had four brothers and three sisters. At some point, his father was injured, and as the main source of income, things got really rough for the family once he could no longer work. Lesra's mom, Alma, knew that the girls in the neighborhood sometimes made it, and she was very aware of the fact that the boys often did not. Her favorite thing to say was, the Lord works in mysterious ways. In a chance encounter, Lesra met up with a group of Canadians who would forever change the path of his life as well as that as Reuben Carter's. My father had a tough time with letting leisure go as well as my mother did. They talked about it and they reasoned and they rationalized why they should and why they shouldn't, you know, saying, well, we don't really know these people. He, they can take them somewhere and then kill them. And then what do they want him for? You know, all of those things. And then they had to toss around the good parts as well. Well, if he goes to college, he can make something of himself and get away from all of this stuff going on around. The commune that he went and lived with, 
was very dedicated to Lesra. They taught him how to read and write. They got him going in school to where he was accelerating in all of his classes. And they encouraged reading all the time. So one day, they end up at this warehouse sale, and Ledra comes across a copy of Ruben's book, The 16th Round, that he wrote while he was in prison the first time. Ledra's new family were young and zealous entrepreneurs living communally. They began to simply surround me with books and surround me with reading material, never forcing me or saying you have to read this, but just surrounding me with it so that I was becoming slowly less afraid of it. So they would take me to bookstores all the time and book sales and libraries and so forth. Lesra tosses a quarter on the counter, takes off with the book, and with the help of the commune, he is able to read this book cover to cover. Um, he is so intrigued by Reuben Carter's story that he actually wrote him a letter and for some reason that no one could explain, it's just the way the stars align sometimes, Reuben actually opened his letter and eventually wrote him back. Um, these two became pen pals. And then eventually, Lesra went up to our, yeah, went to the prison to meet him. Um, creepy fact about that visiting room, it was the previous execution room for that prison. Um, no. Can we meet somewhere else? I'm not going in there. Like, creepy. Anyway, so they meet. And then eventually, you know, they really become tight. And as their relationship grows, Rubin really gets a good relationship going with other people of the commune. Um, it is amazing. But over time, you know, the queen of the castle at the commune was able to work with Rubin's lawyers. And they created a 90-page um, habeas corpus petition and submitted it. By submitting a habeas corpus petition, there is no trial, there's no jury, there's no verdict, there's no sentence. Basically, that 90-page petition was sent to one judge who was assigned to it for him to review and make a decision. So habeas corpus, at least on paper, is you know, the the right for a convicted person to challenge the legality of their conviction. It It's made to make sure that people aren't serving time for a crime that they did not commit. Um, after a period of waiting, which everybody was on the edge of their seat, they couldn't wait to know what the judge said. The judge came back and said, yeah, that this case was, he, you know, this case was a shit show. He called out um, the prosecutors who allowed this, to, you know, prosecutors and the judge who allowed that to become so racially motivated. That was his, you know, that's what he was convicted on, was the racial profiling. He also called out that there was information held by the prosecution, but it was not turned over to the defense, that would have impeached their star witness, Bello, about whether or not he saw them that night. Imagine that. Imagine the prosecution holding back evidence. I mean, I don't know if Tom Fassbender was alive during this time, but if he was, it could have been him. So the judge granted the, the writ of habeas corpus, and he ordered that Carter be immediately released, which was awesome. So Carter got out in 1985 and went and lived in this commune in in Canada. Yeah. Um, the first few years for him were very rough. Um, he married someone. It was not a great relationship. He just, he couldn't find his, his footing. He didn't know, he, he didn't know what to do. You know, for the last 20 years, he's been confined to this little space, and now he's got the whole world around him. You know, it's sensory overload. I can't imagine what it's like for somebody to be released from prison and just put out into the world. Hey, here you go. Like, enjoy. So it took him a while to get his footing, and finally he did. And he started public speaking. He would talk about his story. He started talking about other wrongful convictions that he was concerned about. And he eventually formed the Association in Defense of the Wrongfully Convicted. 
today that organization is responsible for 23 exonerations. So here's Reuben Carter, who by all means was wrongfully convicted and rightfully so pissed off at the world. But he took all of that hatred of the judicial system and law enforcement and turned it into something positive and changed the lives of 23 people, not to mention all the people he's spoken in front of. Now, this organization is still active today. There's a link below. You can check out the cases of the people that they've gotten exonerated and the people that they're working on now. What I find really cool is that the World Boxing Council in 1993 gave him an honorary championship belt. You can win. I mean, is that not the coolest thing? His face is so lit up. He is so happy. And, you know, had all of this not transpired, he might be a household name like Muhammad Ali. You never know. But he never got that chance because of the way this investigation was handled. Sadly, in 2012, Ruben made a public announcement and stated that he had terminal cancer and he was basically given just months to live. Uh, when John Artis heard about this, who was his co-defendant for the, the Lafayette Bar and Grill murders, heard about this, he left Texas and went straight to be with Reuben. He became his main caretaker, and he was there until the day Reuben died, which was April 20th of 2014. Um, he stood by his side. He respected him, and they had a bond that they couldn't share with anybody else based on their life experiences. So even with his health failing in his last months of life, Reuben continued to work for the exoneration of David McCollum. David McCollum had been incarcerated since 1985 for a murder he did not commit. McCollum was 16 when he was arrested. His interrogation was not recorded, but his confession was, and he was later sentenced to life without parole for this crime. Just weeks before his death, Rubin sent an opinion piece to the New York Daily News requesting an independent review of David's case. As you can see here, there's a couple portions from that article, but I will link the whole piece down below so you can read it. Rubin is very eloquent with his words, but yet very, you know, he just puts the nail in there and lets him know exactly what he's thinking. Um, I am excited to announce that Rubin's dying wish came true. David was exonerated on October 15th of 2015. You know, a few, a few years down the road now, David works for the Legal Aid Society. He is now a father. And in November of 2017, he filed a $50 million lawsuit against the state of New York and the police department that put him through all of this stuff. For 10 years prior to Reuben's death, he and his friend Ken Klonsky were working on David McCollum's case. On October 1st of 2017, Ken released a book about his work with um, Reuben Carter and with David to get David ultimately exonerated. I was going to get you guys the link for the book because it looks super interesting. And in the, along the second review underneath the description of the book, there is this review. Quote, I was the judge who granted a writ of habeas corpus to Reuben Hurricane Carter, resulting in his freedom after serving 19 years in prison for a wrongful conviction. After his release, we became friends, and he often spoke of his commitment to re obtain the release of David McCollum. Freeing David McCollum is the compelling true story of the exoneration of another man wrongfully convicted. His miraculous release after 20 years demonstrates that fortunately, there are those among us who will devote themselves unsparingly to freeing the innocent. And that comes from Judge H. E. Lee Seroquin, retired. I thought it was really super cool that this judge took a minute of his retired life to write that statement to say that David's story is just as important as Ruben's story was and to be able to show how much dedication Reuben had to those people that he worked for and that he was able to turn his own wrongful conviction into a positive experience to where he could help others. It's also important to note about Klonsky is that he's got some really cool articles 
about Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. I'm going to link those below. I find them extremely interesting. Um, he gives some pretty good insight and some little different spin on information since most of us kind of stay in the same group and we kind of hear the hamster wheel of explanations over and over. It's, get, it's good to get a, um, a different perspective. So I'm going to link those below as well. You can check out um, Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder review on Netflix right now. It is actually really cool. I watched the whole thing. Um, it def definitely was a different time back then. Um, it was filmed in 75 and 76. If you want to see just the part where he talks about Reuben Carter and then there's interviews with Bob and Reuben and pretty much the entire song Bob performs, um, it is at the one hour, 53 minute and 30 second. So one fifty three thirty is the timestamp that you just go to in that, um, on Netflix. And it's about a 12 minute segment, but it is super cool. Um, also the movie, the hurricane, um, with Denzel Washington, it was released in 99, I believe you can always check that out. Of course, there are some dramatized things in there and, you know, Names have been changed or whatever, but you kind of get the gist of the story. There's numerous books. There's all kinds of stuff. And definitely check out Ruben's book because hearing his words makes it totally different. Um, and of course, Klonsky's book that talks about that last case they worked on together and kind of see, be interesting to read this book that he wrote in prison compared to the books he wrote once he was released for, finally in 85 and how he transformed in his train of thought. It's also important to note that the Lafayette Bar and Grill murders are officially unsolved, as well as the Nathan Blenner's um, murder that took place that um, David McCollum was charged of. That's unsolved. So if anybody happens to have any information about either of those cases, just call Crime Stoppers. You can do that anonymously. They'll take the information they need and pass it along where it's supposed to go. After Ruben was released, um, Lazar Martin went on to complete law school and to this day is a prosecutor in Canada. Um, he kind of lived a low-key life. He just kind of did his deal, you know. He f helped free Reuben. He was going to school just like anybody, you know, anybody else's age. Um, and then the hurricane came out with Denzel Washington and suddenly everybody wanted Lazar to tell a story. And I mean everybody. Eventually he went on Oprah. He was also on the Larry King show. And he was also invited to address the United Nations in uh, 2000. And Ruben was there with him for that. Can't find any good video on that, but if I ever do, I will update the description below. I know this was long and it was a lot of information. I hope you guys find it interesting because I definitely find Ruben's case interesting. And I really enjoy Bob Dylan's song about it. Um, like I said, it's like a 10 minute long song, but it, it, it runs the case down pretty well. Um, it might remind you of our good friend Stacey Seabrook, who writes songs about Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, to be able to take those, the facts of the case, and put them into words, and then create this narrative in a song is just mind-blowing to me, to be able to take all those steps. Like, I I'm either going to have to read it, or listen to you sing. I can't get to that. I can't do all that. So I find it really cool that they're... You know, that Bob Dylan was able to do this for Reuben Carter. And also, I'm going to go plug Stacy again, that he's able to do it for Stephen and Brendan. Fun fact about me, my favorite Bob Dylan song is called Forever Young. I would include it, except you two would have a stroke. So, I just wanted to show you this. I have it hanging on our staircase as you come down the stairs. I was able to find this randomly one day. I was walking through the store and it caught my eye. And I'm like, those are the lyrics to my favorite Bob Dylan song. So... I'm going to go ahead and head out now. There'll be a couple more little snippets of Ruben and Bob Dylan as we as we roll on out. Um, thank you guys all so much for sticking with me. I hope you found this case interesting. I do. I think it's a magnificent story, and I find it amazing that on a whim, people can, you know, one person can start something that changes the life of everybody else. And in this case, it was Bob Dylan. So with that, peace out, Girl Scouts, and I will talk to you soon. Um, I'm going to leave you with this sentiment, and I hope it, I hope it fills your heart with something today. May God bless and keep you always. May your wishes all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. And may you stay forever young. Peace out, Girl Scouts. Have a great day. Taken from his family sent to prison forever and ever, amen. That made me sick.
furious. You know what I mean? And I said, no, I'm not going to stand for this. I'm not going to do this. I have a story, and I know that people essentially are decent people. People basically are decent. They, they may get caught up in an organization, and the organization is full of crap. But the people are basically decent. And I knew that if I could get my story out, and I could lay it in front of you, and you read it, you have to say, hey, this guy was done badly. And we know that since people are basically decent, if they see an unfair situation going on, people will usually rise to the occasion. And that's, what I, that's, what, that's why I'm standing here before you today. A group of Canadians, people who, people who had no idea about going down to, to America and grabbing America's most infamous prisoner out of their midst and bringing her back to Canada. They had no intention of doing that. But they saw that something was wrong. And, in, and, and by the fact that I was able to read and write and write that book and cast that book out on the sea of life, like I was in a desert island, you understand? And put that book in the bottle and cast it out on the sea of life and let it bob up and bob down and bob up and bob down. And somebody saw that thing, that, that bottle in the water, which was Lesra, and picked it up and read it and said, I hear you. There's a man out there on some, some deserted island. He needs some help. He needs a boat to be sent to his rescue. He needs food. And here I am in front of you today. Don't tell me things, nothing can be done. Keep on going. Bob always been searching. Every time I see Bob now, in which we don't see each other frequently, but every time I see him, I ask Bob, have you found it yet, Bob? And Bob say, yeah, I found it. But I know he hasn't, because he keeps searching. <laughs> He always say, uh, hey, what are you searching for today? I'd say, uh, what? He'd say, yeah, I know you're a searcher. What are you searching for? I'd say, uh, well, Hurricane, I'm searching for the Holy Grail. He'd say, what? I said, uh, I'm going to search until I find it. Like Sir Galahad. That's what I'm looking for.